welcome yeah thank you for coming yeah thank you for coming on your on your saturdays yeah. uh delighted to be here with with mark and alimi um to talk about mark's book Indeed. and especially mark for giving up your your sunday saturday night i'm assuming it is but it's very late for you yeah it's now sunday but uh well we'll, we'll say saturday <laughs> just for just for kicks <laughs> keep us on the same page all right well um yeah thanks everyone for coming we um we're here with cmx connect um hopefully we all get to connect with mark today and um connect with his book too um here are the book club um so many good industry books of late um lots of community books didn't always feel that way you know but there's been lots of things created in the last couple of years um, so yeah, I was going to ask Alimi how you got into CMX Connect. Um, what brought you to to get involved and start organizing events? So because today's chat is going to be all about events and building community around it. So Alimi, how did it start for you? Yeah, so I came across uh, CMX in 2017. At that time, I had some work stuff going on in the Bay Area, so I decided to check it out. And then in 2018 at Portland, we had the very first um, CMX con um, summit. So ever since then, I thought, hmm, how would I, you know, bring this to Nigeria and in organize uh, developer communities um, with Google, Facebook, Wikipedia, and TED. So I'm like, hmm, how about I take this to you know, bring people together so that it could connect and, you know, learn. So that was how I joined um, the CMX community. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I um, I mean, in some ways it was similar for me, I think. And instead of Nigeria, it was it was Scotland. I was um, just felt like it was a small number of people working in community here maybe not as recognized as it was stateside. And I started getting the few people that I knew together uh, in person. Um, and eventually, you know, after running events for a little while, which were really just meeting in the pub, to be honest, um, and getting a few people I knew that worked in the industry together, but it's got to start somewhere. Um, then I heard about CMX and I felt like, oh, well, it'll be the push that I need really to be a bit more organized um, be a bit more regular about putting the events on. And uh, it has been great. And it really opened up a whole world to me, I think of meeting other people in the industry, lots of other countries. Um, and eventually I did go to CMX summit uh, 2019, which was great. And to, to suddenly be there with hundreds of other people doing a similar role when I felt like I could, count on one hand you know the people that that did what i did uh, and understood it was uh, was a real game changer i think for me so since then i've always tried to keep involved uh, keep going with with cmx um and support others and that's really what we're here to do is to share our learning share our experience um which mark's done with putting all of his great stuff into this book and what we're trying to do with the book club yeah is um to meet the authors learn a little bit more about what went into the book and hopefully for um, some learnings for everyone else. So thanks very much, Mark, again, for, uh, for being here. Um, you know, do you want to just introduce yourself a little bit um, and, and where you're working currently? Sure. No, happy to be happy to do that. And, you know, thank you for having me on. My name is Mark Birch and currently I'm a global startup advocate for AWS or Amazon Web Services, the provider that is running quite a bit of the world's internet today and applications. So it's been really exciting being here for the past nearly two years. Before that, I was at Stack Overflow. So any of you that are familiar with the developer space probably have come across Stack Overflow in your manic searches, trying to find a solution to a problem you're having around code and Stack Overflow is that global community for developers. Before that, I've been a founder of startups. I've been an angel investor, mostly focused on B2B software and a large challenge that was out there way back in the day and, and still is a problem in these days is founders that come from technical roles 
that are trying to sell. They're trying to figure out go to market early on in their startups. And so I ended up forming this group that was just a meetup. I think a lot of us come to this just as we're trying to find this or fill this need somehow. And we figure, okay, if we bring people together, maybe something will happen. So that thing was the enterprise sales forum, which I just thought would be a small group of founders getting together where we could share knowledge about how, how to sell. And then it became this big, huge global thing where we had chapters around the globe, we had 30,000 members, and it was all dedicated to helping elevate the sales acumen for sales professionals. So that's by myself. Very nice. Yeah. And um, this book, if I'm right, it was written during pretty much COVID or it certainly came out in 2020, right? Yeah. <laughs> in 2020, during the summer. Uh, yeah, I don't like it, like to think that it was uh, birthed during COVID, but I think of many things <laughs> during COVID. It, uh, yeah, you had some time, I think. I think we all had a bit of time as we we're trying to figure out what's going to be happening in the world. And so it just happened to be this intersection between my starting at AWS and the fact that my role, which was very much outward facing uh, as an advocate, you're supposed to be out there and seeing founders speaking at events. Well, at the summer of 2020, that wasn't a whole lot <laughs> that was going on. People were just trying to figure out and transition into virtual. So, uh, had a bit of time. I was still onboarding and someone asked me, well, what are some best practices around uh, setting up events? So I wrote a book. <laughs> it didn't end up, wasn't supposed to be a book, but there you go. It's, it's probably good that you didn't know you were writing a book. Um, that could be a bit daunting, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, you know, and I think I think this, things had come out pre-COVID, and I think obviously, especially with events, um, it's probably important that it did happen after that. You know, this big change that we've all had. Um, so we'll definitely get get back into kind of what that means. But yeah, so the book I've read it, um, and yeah, well done. Firstly, you know, writing a book is hard to start with, uh, so you made it and it's done. Uh, will you do another one? Is there another book in you? Do you think? God, hell no. <laughs> no. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, just surf this one for a while. It's what's interesting is that you know, immediately when you when you finish a book, you realize all the things that you didn't include. And that starts to really uh, eat away at you. So hmm. I, I believe that uh, some ideas are starting to formulate or have formulated uh, since originally writing the book that I do want to put together in a, in a longer format. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, but books are certainly yeah. a, a very much a intense level of dedication. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so it's, it's a very actionable book. And, you know, you, you say that at the beginning, you know, you wanted, um, what did you say? I just find this, this quote, um, because one of the things you say, it's like a choose your own adventure book. That's what it was uh, yeah. on page eight here. You know, so this idea that you can kind of dip in various chapters, you know, and, and take what you need. And depending on where you are on your journey, you know, you can find the parts that are, that are most relevant for you at the moment. So that's great. I think, you know, we're all, we're all trying to learn and, and take on more information. And if you can make that easy for someone where they're like, well, actually, I don't have time to read the whole book, but let me read this part um, to start with. So for anyone that is hesitating, um, this, you know, it is that kind of choose your own adventure book. So you can find the bits that are most ref uh, relevant for you. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. And so, you know, having written the book um and i know that it was born out of a little bit of enterprise sales forum and um you know putting down a kind of operations guide for people uh for mm -hmm. chapter leaders and things like that so did i mean so it started that way who's the book for though you know once you got to the end did that change along the way who you were writing it for uh, not so much 
the the idea behind the book was always about the resource I wish someone had you know, put out there in the world when I started doing things on a bigger scale. Like there was no book of this nature. And even CMX wasn't a, really a thing when the Enterprise Sales Forum first launched. And so I just figured, you know what, there needs to be something that is really practical, uh, down to earth, uh, but it just puts it all together. And so was, that was the idea around community in a box. It's okay, just read this, see what aspects of this can be relevant for your particular professional community. And you're right, it, it really is about a choose your own adventure. I mean, it's, you know, some of the things may not necessarily be relevant. Maybe you have a virtual oriented uh, community. You know, there's many of those virtual only communities that have been very successful. I mean, Stack Overflow is one of the, probably the best examples. But the, the audience was always for those, those community managers and people that are out there that are doing it. They may not call themselves community managers or community leaders or builders, but they know they're building something. I think one of the things that did come through though, as I, as I had people review the book, is you know, this is also useful for folks that are in companies and a lot more companies are being asked or people within companies, I should say, are being asked to form communities. And it didn't even occur to me just how big of a groundswell that would be uh, from 2022, uh, from 2020 and onward is the amount of interest that's inside organizations to designate someone to be the community person to lead the charge. And they're not given a script. There's not any sort of playbook or guide to go through and they have to do all this from scratch. That is a really daunting task. So the book's also for those folks that are freaking out right now saying, oh, I got a former community. How do I do this? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, that was one of the things I wanted to ask, actually, because, you know, it, this is a lot about events, right? Like it's event driven, um, you know, communities. And so one of the things that I was curious about is like a sort of big broad question. Um, you know, what's the relationship or maybe the difference between events and community? Is, is it as simple as saying that like events are short term and then communities like this long term thing? Um, but yeah, I was curious what you, if, if there was any difference there or, or a relationship that you're aware of. There's actually a really intimate tie between events and communities. The problem is in the meetup type world, we do think about events, those episodic things that happen that build anticipation. But community is so much more than that. Community is the content that you're creating, the assets that people can, uh, can learn from, can gain value from. So that's the value creation. The events are at anticipation, but you also need this ongoing peer-to-peer -peer engagement. And all three of those elements are what go into what builds a community. And so I started with the thrust of events because that's the thing that most people think about. And they seem to equate events with community stuff, but never truly make the leap. And so my perspective from the book was, well, I, I created a lot of events. But the events, what were what were the, the dots that you know, when you draw that line through those dots, what is this looking like? And it looks like community, but we just don't have a language or a playbook to describe how to take these episodic things that we do called events or conferences or meetups and build something more impactful, which gets you to becoming a community. Right. And something more self-sustaining perhaps as well. And exactly. maybe you can stop organizing everything yourself, uh, you know, and, and start getting other people involved. Um, yep. So one of the things that, that I really liked um, early on, um, you know, can I do this? And it's this idea of like, you know, who who's this for? Like, you know, who starts these things? And quite often, right, like obviously the person that starts it 
they are the passionate one they they are the motivated one that's why they're doing it and that that's where it starts unless you're in a company and you've been asked to do it um which you know you may not be the most passionate or motivated uh, perhaps at that time but taking that aside one of the things that you say is that really it's passion and availability are the key ingredients right to 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 start with um and then you talk about other skills and factors um that are important too but yeah, uh, taking that passion and availability, um, what else is important for, for a community builder, you know, that, that's taking on this this huge challenge? Sure. Yeah, I, I almost think about, you know, when I, when I, wrote, the, when I wrote the book, that it was more of a, a scare tactics <laughs> to drive people away because <laughs> when, when you think about what goes on in building a community, uh, it can be really, it can be daunting and you don't realize it. You just have to go along and you get started and then like it starts rolling and you think, wow, this became something and oof, do I, is this really for me? And that's a definitely a question I had in my mind going back to the, uh, the enterprise sales forum, which was, I didn't go into this trying to build a community. It was just a meetup. And then hundreds of people would go to events and that was mind blowing. Then people around the, the U S and around the world would email me saying, Hey, you know, when, when are you starting a chapter here? So when it goes into like why I, why someone should do it and if it's really for them, yeah, you know, passion availability, but I also look into your motivations because that's going to be a driver for your long-term success. And what I mean by that, just like a startup, if you, if you're not passionate about the idea, when you, when you come across those first challenges, which are always going to happen, you're going to quit. And so you go that dig deep inside of you, have some introspection and say, Hey, you know, uh, is this for me? You know, what's my motivation? Why do I want to do this? And I feel that if you're, if on that scale between selfish and selfless, that your motivations are more towards the selfish side, you're going to have challenges. I do think that there's something about being a more of a giving type of person that lends those organizers to be successful. Now there's a, there's a downside and we could talk about some other point, uh, during this uh, conversation, but you, you got to start there. Like the heart has to be in it. And that's really where the why comes from and the ability to sustain through what's going to be a really challenging, daunting experience. Yeah. And, and actually I did kind of want to jump forward a bit because one of the things that resonated later in the book, which is page 131, we're dealing with setbacks. So you sort of mentioned it there, like, you know, when you're challenged and, you know, the things, the things that are listed in here, um, you know, are to, they're mostly people focused things, I'll, not all of them, but a lot of them, you know, the dealing with the personalities and some of the egos, the turnover of people, burnout, um, you know, making sure that things are diverse and looking after members, you know, these are all like, they're almost like people management challenges that people might have in their roles, you know, within, within an organization. And what I did like at the beginning was you said, you know, you're very, um, very motivating to say like, you don't need all of the skills, right? Like to get started, passion and availability are important because you need to be doing it for the right reasons. But I wondered if some of the skills that, uh, that someone might need even early on or to think about building skills in is more in that sort of people management and coaching things, right? Where, where you're like um, having to deal with difficult characters and have difficult conversations at times. Is that a good place to, to build your skills before thinking about lots of other uh, areas? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Uh, yeah, I like the, you know, I work a lot with startup founders and yeah, a lot of, a lot of founders, they're not, 
equipped with all the skills I need to have to be really good people managers, to be leaders of people, right? <laughs> then, you know, they, they, they got into this thing because they were passionate about, well, I want to, I want to build this thing. I want to solve this mm. problem. Uh, not going into it thinking, yeah, I want to manage a team of a hundred or a thousand. That's, that is a huge leap. Yeah. I don't, I don't necessarily think that you need to come into building something you're passionate about with a whole lot of management skills or leadership skills. I do think you need to have a, a very, the type of mindset that is one of abundance, that's one of growth, that's one of hum, humility, just having that mind, understanding you're not going to know everything. And that's okay. Right. And, no, and you, that, and that, yeah. Start there. Yeah, I was going to say, there's a little delay. There's a little there's a little delay, um, so sorry if I cut you off from time to time. But you just you mentioned their growth, and um, you talk about growth mindset a few times. So yeah, please say a little bit more about you know yeah. that aspect, which you don't need all of the skills in the world to have, right? Yeah. Yeah, the best, the best founders, and I think this very much translates into the best community builders is you want to experiment. You're just like, let me try this. Let me figure this out. <laughs> and you got to be a bit of a tinkerer in some regards, uh, because you got to iterate in order to figure out well, what things work, what things don't work. And so if you're, if you have that growth mindset, it means that you have a learner's mentality that you're going to listen to ideas that you're going to be a bit more open than closed off. And so when I look at this spectrum of, you know, risks taking and risk adverse, it, it tends to work better if you are, you know, more risk taking, but calculated, not just, you know, reckless, but that will get you a lot farther than having a whole bunch of people management skills. I think, uh, you know, those skills, hopefully you learn over time. And, you know, again, if you have that growth mindset, maybe you pick up a book or maybe you uh, reach out to someone to help mentor or advise you along the way to mm. help you acquire those skills. Uh, I certainly didn't have <laughs> you know, a lot of those skills when I started the enterprise sales form. One thing I will say, I think it's okay and kind of important to realize that we all have some sort of supernatural gift. We may not have tapped into it, but I think if you have at least like something that you feel confident about, at least it's something you can lean against lean into when things do get challenging and that superpower could be in lots of different respects it could be you're a master organizer of events it could be you're really good like you you're super empathetic and you understand people it could be maybe you're a really good marketer or promoter whatever that is like being able to lean into that that one superpower you have is helpful Yeah. Um, all right. And so another part that you, you then talk about is, um, you know, the members themselves, right? So you're passionate about something and, and, and you started these events because you care about it. And no doubt there's someone out there that, you know, that's into it as well. We know that now with the internet, because there's always somebody, you know, on the other side of the world and, and, and they find each other. But as you as you start to build these events, you know, you you have a bunch of assumptions, no doubt. And mm -hmm. so you need to start testing those and, and talking to your members. And so you make this point around, you know, just interviewing, just surveying, you know, a bunch of them every now and again to kind of remind yourself and test those assumptions. Mm -hmm. And then also probably learn a few things about why people are coming and, and what they hope to get. So it sounds like you've probably done quite a lot of these interviews. Have you got any tips for people on you know, on running these, do you do them in a very structured way or is it more of a kind of free flowing thing where you just have a little checklist of, of your assumptions that you want to test out? It, data can be wonderful, it can be tricky, right? So you can do MPS type scores or net promoter scores. You can do CSAT type 
uh, things, but it could also obscure a lot of things that could be really valuable that you learn from your community. So I always like to think of it as what are you doing from a qualitative standpoint and a quantitative standpoint? And the qualitative doesn't have to be any anything of structure, but just having time dedicated to talking to members, to talking to your other community leaders, uh, to set up one-on-ones. Uh, I always made it a practice to whatever whatever chapter we were launching, I wanted to talk to members. Like, yeah, it's great to be up on their stage, to lead interviews, to launch a chapter, but ultimately these things are about the people. And so you got to understand, well, what are their motivations? What do they care about? What are they getting out of it? What's the value equation for them? And, and that's important. And it actually guided me along the way in terms of figuring out, well, what is the, what is the real value enterprise sales for? I remember this one conversation very succinctly. It was a, uh, a lady, uh, it was really early in her, in her career. And we started chatting at one of the New York chapter events and it got really, uh, you know, very visceral very quickly because she was just very transparent. She said, I, I thought I was going to quit sales forever. Like three months ago, I was ready to throw in the, throw in the towel. I didn't think I had what it, what it takes. I wasn't getting support from my manager and it was, it was dark and she just, let it all out there and told me, look, I, I, I started coming to these events because of a, a colleague of mine told me about it. And it just changed my entire perspective. Like I just felt inspired every time I left one of these events with the people I met, with the, the, the insights that were being shared on the stage and just how welcoming and inclusive of a community it is it convinced me I can do this. And I, and she said uh, a few months later, we reconnected said, yeah, I've had the, the personal best months of my sales career, uh, by a long shot. And she was the best, uh, sales development rep of the month. Like what like an incredibly real and an uplifting experience personally for her, right? I mean, it was just a life changing because now she has a career that she feels that she really belongs in and can own. But, uh, but it's those types of insights you can't get just from doing regular interviews or, or, or doing surveys. And I do believe that surveys are important because it kind of gives you the directionally where you're heading, but having those real conversations and capturing those super important. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think um, you can over survey and, you know, you can spend a lot of time and yeah, as you say, you get all this data. Um, but, you know, if you just go and talk to five, 10 people, it will always be such a surprise and you're likely to get what you're talking about. You know, you get that feedback, which can be huge for yourself as well. Good and bad, but usually there's good um, and sometimes an incredible goodness like you've talked about. This seems so this seems like a good time to, to jump on a little bit. Um, so, you know, you, you, there's a section of the book, kind of, I guess, the, the guts of the book really um, were about building the community. And one part of it, one aspect is the community flywheel. Right. So you, you're, you're trying to get this thing to sustain and, and, and grow. Um, and one part you talk about is recruiting volunteers because a lot of us know we're quite often doing this ourselves and, and you know, getting other people involved is massive. Um, that in itself is a lot of work, but if you get the right people, which is what you talk about in the book, um, it can really help. So one of the things that you say on uh, page 104 is that you need to be careful about who you get so you need to figure out what their motivations are, which we mentioned earlier. And you talk about doers and talkers. Can you tell us a little bit about doers and talkers? Yeah. That's, uh, well, one, I got to give credit where credit's due. That, that wasn't my 
my concept of phrasing. And I'm really hating myself right now because I can't, I can't remember. But I, I succinctly remember a podcast. And it was uh, a podcast by a, a church leader based in Atlanta who kind of verged into doing a lot of conversations about leadership, you know, in the frame of the church. But uh, I really liked his perspective. And one of the episodes I really enjoyed most was this idea of givers and takers, because in any sort of group thing, you have the people that, that do the work, and then there's people that are kind of there that talk a lot, they have all the ideas. But ultimately, you know what the idea is, it's like you're putting on events. It's not the, it isn't rocket science. So mm -hmm. if you know that there's a playbook and one of the secrets of, of the book is that it started as an 18 page operations guide of the enterprise sales form. You yeah, know, now it's a, like 180 pages, but <laughs> that's another story. But those 18 pages were the playbook of how we do things. So when we started another chapter, what was important is that we didn't have people that want to debate the, the operations guide. A lot of people I just looked at and said, okay, this is great. Let's do it. And it's very obvious early on uh, when you find the people that are like, yeah, let's do this. And they do it versus the people that want to talk a good game. They talk about doing, but they never lift a finger. And that's that could be the, the death knell for your organization, your community, because like, those talkers will not get anything that they won't advance the mission. They're more self-interested generally, and they don't add value to what you're doing. They don't, they don't inspire others as well. That, that's also a key thing is that the people you bring on as leaders, it's like, if you get the wrong person in, it's like a virus. It can start bringing other people down and it, it could get really ugly very quickly. And you as the community founder and, and the you know, penultimate leader, you need to be very vigilant about, about that because that mix can be super deadly. And I've seen that happen, not only in my community, uh, or the communities I've managed and built over the years, but in other communities as well. Like, be really careful about who you, because you want volunteers, right? <laughs> so you don't want to close, like slam the door yeah. shut. But you just got to know like who you're opening doors for. Right. And I think, you know, um, for lots of us, especially getting going, you're like, oh, they're interested, you know, we want to get them in. Yeah. And you feel like, you know, you don't want to say no. You don't want to say no to anyone. And then you're like, oh, no, who have I let in? So I, I totally get that. Um, yeah. I understand. Um, okay. So um, just jumping on, I'm really conscious of time and I feel like I could talk to you. I know you're probably wow. knackered and tired but <laughs> i feel like i could talk to you all night it's very easy so this is great um but we've got a few questions as well so i want to make sure we have yeah. time for that um so let me just one thing i wanted to ask you about a little bit because as you said this book did come out you know kind of once covid had, had started um venues so you, you talk a little bit in there about you know venues and very much an in-person you also talk about virtual events as well and now that we're feel like we're coming out of it perhaps and definitely travel i mean you've obviously just made this journey to singapore i feel like i've got some travel plans that are starting to come together and i i would love to get my community together in person i don't think we'll do it this year i think i'm going to wait but i feel like we're getting there but when i do i definitely want to be looking at hybrid events um and this was something when i started with cmx in scotland with we a very small number of people i felt like what would really be great was was a hybrid event where we could tap into this huge network that we're, we're elsewhere physically but still get us together in person um in scotland so yeah i wondered for you like now with this mixed or hybrid idea um, have you started to lean into that and have things changing for you? And, and how have you found um, trying to organize that and make it happen? It's a difficult question to answer because 
I don't think my answer is going to be really positive. And it's hard to, to hear that because I think a lot of people are putting energy in the hybrid. I think it's a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, here's why. I've already been going to quite a few events. And yes, I mean, COVID is still important as a consideration, but I think the the reality is that we're now post COVID, we're, we're endemic. Large parts of the world, uh, large parts of Asia are opening up, for example. So what I've started to realize is that with these events coming on, they all have hybrid, they all t talk about it. The execution is pretty, uh, wide ranging and there's no doubt in my mind that the folks that are doing this from virtual are feeling left out like it just it does not translate at all and you're looking at this energy of like all these people like excited doing stuff having their side conversations you know even the more internal facing stuff uh so you know, doing your internal kickoffs, for example, or all hands meetings or uh, off sites. The people that are in person having that experience is a very different experience than the folks that are, you know, on a on a Zoom or whatever your conference software is. But being in that virtual remote setting, you're missing out on a lot of those connections. And so I think hybrid it's super tricky and i think there's still things that we can learn and maybe improve about that experience but be very clear it's going to be it's going to be a different experience people are going to be in person are just going to get way more out of the connections and bonds that are made in person and you can't replicate that virtually yeah i i don't disagree that yeah, the experience is, is different. I guess some people, you know, may not want to travel or I guess what oh, yeah. it has to say is it's not so much just, just COVID. It was also partly this, this geography thing of, yeah, being able to tap into these people and maybe for the way I was approaching, it was actually less about, you know, getting 50, a hundred people online to my small in-person event. It was more about getting someone like you is getting, you know, one or two people virtually into our small in-person event so that we could meet these people and, and talk yeah. to them, right? Maybe if and, the focus and, is on the person yeah. who's online, that's yeah. different. Yeah, I think, and that's where I think we, we need to make a conscious decision. What is the audience? Like, what, what, did, what are we expecting them to get out of the experience and start there first? Like at Amazon, we have this concept of working backwards from the customer as part of our leadership principles of customer obsession. And what that means is you can go build your thing, write your book, you know, you know, do whatever it is that you do. But if you start from like the me perspective and go out, you're gonna miss a whole lot. And you're, not, you're probably not gonna hit any level of success. When I wrote the book, it wasn't because I wanted to write a book. It was because I felt that, that there was an audience out there that was really struggling with how to deal with events, how to deal with community, particularly in a virtual world, and thinking about what happens after that, after COVID. And that's where I started and worked backwards from there, you know, from my own experience as well, to enrich that, you know, that thing that I ended up creating. So think about the audience perspective first. Think about what your needs of the community and create an event around that. And don't worry about whether you're trying to make it hybrid or not. I think hybrid is going to be challenging always. So this, like this is amazing, right? Because you can get experts, you can have these intimate conversations and the whole world can, can tune in. I mean, that's exactly why I started doing the clubhouse shows. You know, so I launched an audio spaces program within AWS so that our startup segment can reach a global audience during the pandemic because we couldn't travel. There wasn't meetups. I think a lot of people were getting a, a level of exhaustion with being on video all the time and just having audio only as a channel was, mm -hmm. I think, a lot for folks 
to plug in to content that was interesting for them. And we had a lot of success just focusing on audio as, as a channel for connecting people out there, entrepreneurs out in the world, wherever they are in their entrepreneurial journey, with experts that, that we on the AWS side would interview. And we'd have these deeply enriching conversations about entrepreneurship, startup life, uh, cool and interesting, unique innovations uh, being built in different industries. And it's become this incredible repository of knowledge. And people have connected through that. So it's, you just got to know the audience, work backwards from there, and then you'll get to the type of, uh, the type of thing, event, content, whatever, that's going to add the most value. Yeah, and uh, actually Ella makes a good point there that, you know, there's an accessibility element and you actually talk a lot in your book about accessibility yeah. um, from a physical point of view of in-person, but I guess virtually as well. Maybe that's something to think about in terms of hybrid is, okay, well, you're not going to have the in-person experience, but we can still get you here and we can still give you a taste of it. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And yeah, audio, we could we could talk for ages about about what an audio event is and how you feel very different when you don't have video on um, and it's just audio. I haven't done, I haven't run any events on, on Clubhouse or anything, but I've certainly been to many and have talked and things. And um, it's very different when you've just got audio and you're able to walk around. I mean, that's what I'm like on the phone is I'd like to get up and, and walk around. So yeah, I'm, I'm really getting his sense but as, as, I'm, as I'm watching you, you're because I know you're standing and you're kind of like you're, you're doing your, your dance. Uh, and I do that too. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I want to move. Much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. I've got one last question because then I want to um, for those that have, that have turned up really appreciate it. And they've asked some great questions. So my last question, because um, March for CMX is uh, March. So we're getting deep into metrics. So but the final point I wanted to ask you about was, um, yeah, was metrics around, you know, what you talk about in the book in terms of events and you make a, you know, a critical point around um, that it's interaction that's important, right? It's the interaction metrics and the value people are getting rather than sheer numbers. I mean, tonight we've got four attendees and us and I might be like, oh, well, I've completely failed. You know, we, we don't have enough people here, but I know because I've got a lot of value from this conversation. I'm sure the others that are here have too. Um, so yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your approach to, to metrics? Sure. Uh, super important. I, I am a believer that if you aren't measuring stuff, you have no idea what progress or impact you're making. So it's easy to get trapped in the in the vein of vanity metrics, you know, like numbers of people and all that. And I think that is certainly a thing to, to not ignore, but that's not impact. And I talked about working backwards and thinking about your audience first before you host events and all that. Well, it's the same with metrics. You kind of, you got to work backwards from what people most care about. So it's important to understand if you, are thinking about the motivations of people of wanting to be in your community. Well, what are they getting? Why are they in the community? What value are they getting from it? And so start there. So you have an understanding of what that impact of having a community is. Because ultimately community is we're connecting people. And in a way it's unlocking exponential value. What is that value? If you understand what that is, then you can then you can think about ways of smart ways of, of measuring how you're creating value over time. Sometimes it could just be through the engagement, sharing it could be the amount of user generated content. Uh, it can be the outcropping of uh, of people connecting off a platform, you know, to start ideas or to join a program whatever it may be, you know, understand what that is. And then you can look backwards into, okay, are the growth numbers getting us to where we need to? Are we hitting the, the numbers from a membership standpoint that are getting us you know, closer to that goal? And then you're starting to connect the dots. There's a blog post I wrote, uh, God, ages ago 
that was more for internal uh, IT teams that talked about L1, L2, L3 metrics. And the idea was that you know, your L1s or level one metrics are just those vanity metrics, but they're still, they're still important. You want to track them, but that's not value. Then you start to look at, well, what are the, what are the, the outcomes, the consequences of, of the, of events or the community that were created? So look at that and that could be things like engagement. And then there's an, a level three or L3, which are the business goals. Like what's the vision? What are the goals from a strategic standpoint? And so if you think about from your own community perspective, it's what are those L3s? Those L3s are what matters most to the community. You know, your community, hopefully you have some sort of like, you know, values or vision statement or tenants or principles. And that could be your guide in terms of what you really want to measure. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I would like to turn it over to um, to those people that have, have come along today, tonight, to this morning, wherever, <laughs> whatever it is for you. Uh, so let's just have a, a little look at the questions. Um, and Elle is saying, I think she's happy for me to ask on her behalf. So let's have a look at the Q&A here. Have you ever had to cut your losses with a community initiative? perhaps where you've invested significant time or effort into building an events program or strategy and had to abandon it. What were the reasons for that decision and did it have any repercussions on how you approach community building in its aftermath? Hmm. I would definitely say that from a, from a community perspective, it's not been necessarily a whole community, but there definitely been uh, chapter launches that have gone not well. And when I look back, it, it comes down to some of the things that we talked about today. You just had the wrong people in place. Like you, you had volunteers that felt that they were going to be committed and they just weren't. Uh, they didn't really want to do the work, for example, or they were more self-interested. It was more about driving business for themselves. Uh, so you, you, you can't, in the startup space, we talk about this concept of uh, uh, hire slow, fire quickly, which sounds kind of uh, harsh, but the reality is that you, you can't take on the risk of having a bad hire. The longer that, that hire stays on board, the worse it is for uh, your results, uh, for progress of the startup, as well as the morale of other people that are on the team. So I quickly just cut, cut bait and close the chapter rather than having, uh, having that chapter, uh, kind of grow and mutate into a virus into something which is not going to be representative of our uh, overall community values. And so I shut it down. So yeah, uh, just look out for the signs. Don't let things linger. Uh, in terms of repercussions, the repercussions are if you kind of kept it too long, uh, those are going to have way bigger implications and repercussions than if you acted fast. Hopefully that answers your question. Maybe elle has got a big decision to make perhaps here, um, but cut the limb off is the, is the advice. Um, all right, let's turn to Emily. So Emily asks, do you believe that events should be exclusive for active community members or open to help invite new prospective members in? Yeah, my pre predilection is always events should be a little bit more open than closed. Uh, but that certainly doesn't, uh, doesn't mean you would have maybe more exclusive types of gatherings. And this is actually something that we do at AWS uh, to, to good effect. You know, we have different uh, developer-oriented programs like AWS Heroes, Community Builders, and then we have our user groups. And so we have more of this kind of tiered structure in terms of our, uh, our community leaders and active participants. So the user groups are for everyone. Anyone can go to a user group anywhere in the world. And we have you know, well over 100, I guess there's actually a few hundred, 
around the globe. But if you want to get to the next level, you, you kind of have to show that commitment. You have to show, okay, what am I, what am I doing uh, to help this community? And you, you can then kind of elevate to becoming a community builder and then ultimately an AWS hero. And that's when you, from the AWS side, we like to reward those types of commitments and the value of, of doing their work in the community. So we do have special exclusive events for them. And oddly enough, that ends up being a, a very good recruiting tool for getting other volunteers. Because they say, wow, those community builders, they're getting like awesome swag or those heroes, they get to meet uh, these super awesome, amazing, well-known people at AWS, like Werner Vogels in person. And they all share that. And then all the other folks in the, all the user groups around the world say, wow, how can I do that? And it gets people to come into the fold. So it's an interesting dynamic. It's a little bit of, yeah, I, I'm not necessarily a, a fan of the word gamification, but it maybe dehumanizes the, the ways that we operate. But there is a bit of a programming inside of our minds where, you know what, games, games are addictive. Games get us involved. They, they motivate us to action. And so that's that's kind of how I think about events is you want to have a tier which is wide open, but maybe you have more exclusive things. You have that funnel that you create or a pyramid, whatever your uh, concept du jour is to, to spur on even greater commitment. Yeah, I think that makes sense. It's, um, you know, a commitment curve, it's that sort of idea, isn't it? And another term, but something, something that ladders up or, or tears up. Thanks very much. All right. So last question um, from Catherine. Um, we talked a little bit about metrics, but she's asking, do you have advice for communicating the more qualitative aspects of community back to the organization? Um, it can be a challenge to bring that back to stakeholders. Sure. Uh, I do want to just address the one comment here about hierarchical. Yeah, I don't necessarily call it like separating the you know, men from the the boys, it's more about recognizing and elevating really committed members and saying, hey, you know, this is what it means to 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 be a participant and to do really good work in the community. Uh, and yeah, it does. It can create a little bit of a, like an exclusivity type thing that but it's not off putting. I think, again, you know, if you have the, the wide funnel, you open it up and you make events for the community accessible, but then show people there's pathways of being involved. That's a lot more of a positive experience. But to the question of um, metrics, can you state it again, Jamie, just so I, I understand clearly? Yeah. So basically thinking more about the qualitative aspects of community value, um, mm -hmm. how do you communicate that back to stakeholders, to the organization? Because that can be a challenge than, than quantitative. Uh, you got to do both. Uh, so perfect example, I'll share a little bit of the inside baseball, uh, kind of the inside how the, how the sausage gets made. But at AWS, I think there was a question early on about the value of doing these shows on Clubhouse. It was a new channel, it seemed like it was a lot of hype, it didn't seem like it would really jive well with what AWS is as an organization. So I, you know, again, kind of putting on my entrepreneurial hat, I just thought, okay, well, what can we do early on to prove value? So I had the, the quantitative metrics, but I also made sure to capture some of the really important qualitative learnings. What were the experiences from people that were listeners on the show? What was the experience of people that were speakers on the show? And so I put that all together in a trip report. That's just kind of our terminology for uh, our, our report about an event, you know, our internal debrief, and where we share, you know, what the event was, you know, why we hosted it, what the audience was, what were the outcomes, all the metrics. And so in my trip report, I'm very clear to say, okay, well, here's just what we know just from a metric standpoint early on, even though we are going to develop those metrics over time, but also here's the qualitative. 
Because ultimately, when you're trying to work with stakeholders, they need to hear a narrative. Yeah, we think about the data, the data, data, data. But ultimately, a lot of people make decisions not based on the data. Data ends up being more of a way of justifying already preconceived notions. And if you read the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, you'll get a really good perspective on uh, how people think. We already come with lots of biases. And so your job in working with stakeholders is to kind of navigate and unlock some of those biases so you can use those for your advantage and influence a decision to support a community. Uh, and I do recommend that book. It's a bit of a, a meaty read. It's going to take you a while. Uh, but it definitely gives me a lot of insights into uh, how to how to manage things like stakeholder relationships. Uh, and then understand that it's not always going to be the data. Well, it's almost never the data which convinces people. It's always that story. And the story is built on the qualitative elements of what you're learning about your community as it's growing. And then using the data as a way of backing into the story. You're on mute, buddy. <laughs> You're on mute. Save, save me. Yeah, that was, that's um, that's great. And I think you know a lot of the time we we share all of the data, but it's those couple of verbatim comments from someone, right? That they're those are the ones that stick in the mind. So. Really great, right? We're at time, so um, really appreciate it. Um, it's been fantastic to talk to you. We're going to do a quick raffle um, of your book. We're going to send a couple of copies out for those that have uh, that have awesome. shown up tonight. So if you could stick around, that would be great. Just to see this wheel of names in action, which uh, I think Alimi's going to now spin for us, um, so that we can send out a couple of copies. And whoever's name comes up, if you could. Uh, DM me or, or um, yeah, get in touch with me. I'll uh, put my Twitter on here and I just need to get your address. Well, Amy, are you all right to um, do the wheel of names? Oh, it's coming. <laughs> Emily is first. Well done, Emily. All right, let's spin it one more time. Julia, all right. That's great. Can you still hear me okay? Yes. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear you. Congratulations yep. to Emily. If you DM me, I will um I will get your uh get a copy out to you from from Mark. Um thanks very much Mark and thanks everyone for coming along. And uh off to bed for Mark and um yeah, hope that you enjoy the rest of your your days everywhere else. Thanks very much everyone for coming. Thanks Mark. Yeah, great. Take care. Bye. Yeah, bye.